Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first in-person showcase in a while. <laughs> so I'm Robin Garrell. I'm the president of the Graduate Center. I'm delighted to welcome you to our sixth annual dissertation showcase. Um, I was sharing with some of the students, this is one of my two favorite events of the year. I say, well, what else is there? Um, and that should be obvious, it's commencement, the awarding of degrees, uh, but this is right up there. And um, we're just here to celebrate the cutting edge research conducted by graduate center doctoral students and to push their pioneering academic work out from the lab, the field and the library and to the public square. And that's a key part of our mission here as a public university. We pride ourselves on being a place where scholars connect with the public and share their ideas with a broad audience. It's also part of our well, responsibility as citizens of a connected world. Solving complex global challenges we face involves collaboration and communication and expressing the findings of serious scholarship in language that's easily understood by non-specialists. Um, that's increasingly important uh, in every field of endeavor. So our invitation to these scholars has been to explain their work in terms that are accessible to all of us, uh, the curious public. The 13 students we will hear from tonight embody the quality and diversity of research across our programs. And these 13 represent just a tiny fraction of the more than 3,200 students currently immersed in academic explorations here at the Graduate Center. Now, completing a PhD program is a long and difficult journey. The students here tonight have taken on an additional challenge, capturing years of research and maybe hundreds of dissertation pages into a brief and engaging story. They've selected and distilled their work into a three minute presentation created for a general audience, and that's you and the folks joining us online. Now this year we had 50 students apply to participate in the showcase. And so we had the really difficult task of choosing just 13 participants for tonight's event. So I want to thank the selection committee of faculty and staff who read the submissions and chose the participants, and of course congratulate the participants on being selected for this opportunity. The research they will describe spans disciplines and topics from criminal justice to music to public health to environmental science. And um, this evening, we will once again award the Presidential Prize for Public Communication. This award goes to the presenter who is judged to be the most effective in communicating their work to the public, a key skill in every profession. And as we did for the first time last year, we will also ask all of you here in the room today uh, to take an active role because you will choose the Audience Choice Award. So when the time is right, I'll ask you to cast your vote for the presenter who has done the best job communicating what's interesting and important. Uh, in order to do that, you're gonna need your phone. Please keep it silent until that moment and even after that. And you'll need your program, which has a QR code. We'll tell you more about that later. So each of our presenters is going to get uh, an honorarium and each of our two award winners will receive an additional $1,500 honorarium. So uh, do good, people. Yeah. There's, something, there's something at stake here. You have to buy dinner for your guests here. <laughs> so uh, now I'd like to introduce you to our esteemed panel of judges. Two are here in person and two are streaming in. So I'll first introduce uh, the two who are joining us online. So George and Karen, please turn on your cameras. And uh, that's happening, great. So uh, George Anor is a 2022 graduate of our biochemistry program. His doctoral dissertation explored how changes within the TP53 gene affect the progression of triple negative breast cancer. He's currently pursuing a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health. He won the Presidential Prize for Public Communication last year's dissertation showcase. So welcome, George. We're really glad you're joining us this evening. Uh, would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much, Robert. And thank you for presenting our work last day. And I must say it was really good. It helped me do some 
good for a few friends. So whoever we meet it today to you will be in for a surprise. You can send some money if you don't finish speaking. And lastly, I was fortunate to present, and this year I was also fortunate to be contacted by Karen again to be a part of it. So I'm looking forward to the enlightened with the talk that's going to happen today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the next judge I'd like to introduce is Karen Okigbo. Uh, she is a 2021 graduate of our sociology program, and her work focuses on intermarriage and endogamy amongst second-generation Nigerian Americans and explores their marital decision-making processes. She's currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy, and she will join the University of Massachusetts Boston in the fall as an assistant professor of sociology. Yay! And that's in your futures too. <laughs> um, she won the Audience Choice Award and last year's dissertation showcase. So, Karen, we're delighted to have you back with us. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you all so much for inviting me back. Um, it was such an honor to win the inaugural Audience Choice Award last year. I wish all the presenters here the best of luck, and I look forward to hearing their presentation. All right, thank you. The next judge I'll introduce is Maite Hunko. She's the Vice Chancellor for Communications and Marketing at CUNY and has worked on communications and journalism for more than 30 years. Among her many notable achievements prior to joining CUNY, she led the communication strategy for New York City public advocate Letitia James' campaign for the New York State Attorney General. And before that, she was senior advisor to the chancellor at the New York City Department of Education and spent 15 years as an editor at the New York Daily News. Uh, so Maite, would you please stand and be recognized? Thank you. It's a pleasure to welcome you. Thank you. Um, thank you, President Garrell, for inviting me, for having me. And um, it's great to be here. And on behalf of the chancellor and the chancellor's office, um, Good luck to everyone. I'm really excited to this to do this. A little bit nervous, I have to confess. Um, but I'm wishing everyone, and you know, I'm sure the presenters are more nervous than I am. So good luck to all of you. <laughs> Thank you. And the final judge I'll introduce is Dwight Lee. He's a partner at Gagnon Securities and managing partner of Upland Associates. He serves as chair of the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and has served on the boards of the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, the Political Economy Research Center, and the Jackson Laboratory. He is one of our fantastic trustees on the Graduate Center Foundation. Dwight, thank you so much for all the work you do on behalf of the Graduate Center. We're really glad to have you with us tonight. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, thank you, President Gorel. Thank you. This is my third one of these that I've attended, the uh, first two through Zoom. But I can uh, tell all of you in the audience and online that you're in for a treat. And let me add my congratulations to the 13 of you who made the first cut. And good luck tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Joy. OK, so now we are ready for the students' presentation. So I'll take a moment just to explain how this is all going to work. Each student will present for three minutes, immediately followed by the next student. And after the last presenter, you will cast your vote for the winner of the Audience Choice Award based on the student presentation that made the strongest impression on you. It will be a favorable impression, I can assure you. Uh, after the voting, I will ask the students to join me up on stage here for a live Q&A so where you can ask them questions about their research. And we'll have microphones uh, here in the aisles. We'll ask you to uh, come up for those. Um, before we begin, I want to let you know that our sixth presenter on, the, on your program, Angela Mororo, Moro, uh, is ill and will be giving her presentation by Zoom. So you'll see her up on the screen. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, and that is Melanie Fessinger. Let's begin. Let me tell you a story about a man named Henry Alford. He was a defendant in a criminal case that carried the possibility of the death penalty. He claimed he was innocent and he wanted to take his chances in front of a jury. But the prosecutor offered him a deal. 
he would take the death penalty off the table and instead would recommend a 30-year sentence. But in exchange for doing so, Alfred would have to waive his constitutional right to trial and plead guilty. After reviewing the severity of the sentence that he was facing, Alfred went to court and explained to the judge that he was innocent and he was only pleading guilty because they said they would gas him for it if he didn't. Now before this case, the Supreme Court had said that guilty pleas have to be made by defendants voluntarily. So Alfred appealed his conviction, arguing that his decision was not voluntary and instead was coerced by his fear of the death penalty. But the Supreme Court disagreed and upheld his conviction. It said that just because Alfred was afraid to die did not mean that he did not make a free and rational choice. Which begs the question, what is a voluntary plea? In this world of plea bargaining, where the threat of harsher punishments and sometimes even executions are hanging over defendants' heads. After reviewing the legal, philosophical, and psychological literatures, I discovered that there's no single clear definition of what it means for a decision to be voluntary. So I decided to explore that in my dissertation. I conducted a series of online studies in which nearly 3,000 community members participated in a decision-making task in which they were accused of a crime and offered a deal. My results showed that many innocent people were willing to waive their constitutional rights and accept a punishment for something that they didn't do in exchange for leniency. My results also showed that many people who wanted to exercise their rights were ultimately pushed into waiving them by their defense attorneys. And my results also showed that many people said they felt like they couldn't say no, that they didn't actually have a choice, and pled guilty even though they didn't want to. These results in my dissertation capture some of the realities for the 98% of defendants in real federal and state courts who waive their constitutional rights in exchange for plea deals. This system of pleas allows for innocent people to be punished for crimes that they didn't commit and for defendants to be coerced into waiving their rights by the pressures and the powers of the criminal justice system. It's important that we pay attention to this process because our constitution set up a criminal justice system that was meant to be based on a foundation of fair trials and checks on governmental power, but coerced pleas like these undermine that foundation and lead to a host of consequences for the people who find themselves wrapped up in it. Thank you. You may have heard of the school to prison pipeline a phenomenon that exposes children to the criminal legal system later in life through disciplinary practices in schools. Studies have shown that this pipeline disproportionately affects children and children of color, but the impact of this pipeline on students with disabilities remains understudied. My dissertation focused on understanding the relationship between disability and involvement in the criminal legal system. To research this topic, I analyzed data from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. This comprehensive study has followed a nationally representative sample of adolescents into adulthood, collecting data on a wide range of topics, including physical and mental health, social relationships, education, and employment. What I found was alarming. Students who are identified as having a learning disability or who receive special education services while in school in the United States had a 31% higher odds of being involved in the criminal legal system. The presence of a disability was also associated with a 51% decrease in the odds of high school graduation and a 128% decrease in the odds of attaining a bachelor's degree or higher education. Given these staggering numbers, 
We need to give more attention as a society to disability in our efforts to break the school to prison pipeline. My findings are critical because disability is often neglected and almost never considered as a factor of criminal legal system involvement. Additionally, it is alarmingly seldom included in current efforts to decarcerate. Moreover, disability is identified during, in early childhood during the special education and reasonable accommodation process in schools, which suggests that there is opportunity to intervene earlier and prevent later involvement in the criminal legal system. If we continue to fail to consider disability as a factor in how and why students end up in the criminal legal system, we will continue to miss this opportunity for intervention. In other words, we must demand that schools have the resources to provide reasonable accommodations to students with disability, including using alternative forms of discipline to prevent discriminatory and punitive practices. Such early interventions can break the school to prison pipeline and create more equitable educational environments. One of the key challenges I faced in my research was assessing accurate and comprehensive data on this issue. There is a lack of standardized data collection methods and a general underreporting of disability status in longitudinal data. Given the dearth of data on the relationship between disability and the school to prison pipeline, it is essential that we collect comprehensive data on students with disabilities over their life course, including any contacts with the criminal legal system that they may have. By gathering more data and including disability as a key variable, we can gain a better understanding of the intersection between school age disability and involvement in the criminal legal system which would then allow us to develop more effective intervention and policy to break the school to prison pipeline. Thank you. We live in a time of crises. Pandemics, climate change, wars, and recessions all make the world of the 21st century feel unstable and fragile. Can the practices and discourses of liberal democracy address these crises, or are they headed for collapse? Are we doomed to an autocratic, war-torn, plague-ridden, and overheated future? What does politics look like at the end of the world as we know it? To address these questions, my dissertation turns to the apocalyptic politics of previous centuries. The political principles we take for granted, like individual rights and democratic self-government, themselves emerged through crises, namely revolutions. Modern revolutions were often seen by their contemporaries as apocalyptic in that they revealed the temporary nature of all worldly institutions. Yet since Daniel and John, apocalypse has had two faces catastrophe and redemption, the destruction of the old world and the creation of the new. My dissertation centers on close readings of three authors who viewed modern revolutions apocalyptically. Political theorist Thomas Hobbes addressed the English Civil Wars of the 1640s, theologian Bruno Bauer, the revolutions of 1848, and economist John Maynard Keynes, the Russian revolutions of 1917. Across the centuries and the continent, Hobbes, Bauer, and Keynes grapple with the potential for human agency to completely transform the world in which we live. Each looks for ways to harness this transformative potential, to achieve redemption without catastrophe. I read these authors contextually, drawing on a wealth of secondary sources to ground my reading of each in the concrete stakes of his historical moment. The primary texts could be challenging, especially in the case of Bruno Bauer, whose work has mostly not been translated or even reprinted. <laughs> Luckily, uh, most of Bauer's works are digitized and readable in the original German. Unfortunately, they're also in the original 19th century typesetting. <laughs> Thanks to this kind of digital access, though, I didn't have to change my research plans too much when the pandemic broke out. I had initially finished a draft of my proposal in February of 2020, and at that time, I hoped to visit the Keynes archives at Cambridge the following summer, which didn't work out. But the project remained manageable with the help of university and public librarians. 
CUNY's interlibrary loan system continued operating digitally, and the New York Public Library temporarily loaned out research collection books by mail. I relied very heavily on both. So, suppose these are apocalyptic times, and the last few years give us some evidence. The question remains, which face of apocalypse will we turn to? Catastrophe or redemption? Will we be overwhelmed by climate change, by pathogens, wars, and recessions? Or will we build a world that is more just, free, and equal? This is the political alternative at the end of the world. Thank you. Have you ever listened to someone with an accent? You are listening to one right now. During lectures and presentations, I noticed something intriguing. I found it more difficult to follow accented speakers. This led me to ask whether accents affected how we processed language. My dissertation investigated whether degree of accented on spoken English sentences affected how speakers processed them. In my task, my participants rated how good a sentence sounds. These in linguistics are known as acceptability judgments. For example, participants might hear a sentence like the dog box and rate it as highly acceptable. In another sentence like the frog hop, they are likely to rate it as unacceptable. To this end, I recorded bilingual speakers of Taiwanese Mandarin and English to record English sentences with grammatical errors. These speakers needed a lot of support to sound natural during the recording sessions. The balance between preserving their accents while striving for a standard form of production was challenging. Are you still following? Maybe this will help. The results indicated that people tend to judge accented speech as less acceptable, even when they are in fact grammatical. For instance, the same sentence, the dog barks, sounded less acceptable with an accent as opposed to one who can be passed off as a native speaker. This project taught me that the smallest details in speech production can significantly influence how speakers are regarded. Even when the same sentence is spoken, the presence of an accent can influence our perception. This bias reflects our preferences for accent-free speakers over those who have accents. Therefore, we must refrain from judgments based on accents. As our communities continue to struggle with racial discrimination, it is my hope that my presentation on accentedness will bring awareness to accentism, which is discrimination based on how a language is spoken. Have you ever judged someone by their accent? Before you do next time, I urge you to take a moment and remind yourselves that it is likely that they are going to be hard to follow. Nonetheless, they may have something interesting to share that deserves your attention and patience. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Samantha and I am a rock translator. I collected this rock the day it was born. It was still warm from its journey from the mantle through Earth's crust and out of volcano. Since there are no active volcanoes in New York City, my research process starts in the field outside of New York. We as a volcano community generally can predict when and where volcanic eruptions start. It's an immense challenge to predict what happens during an eruption 
and when eruptions end. So as part of my dissertation research, I focus, focused on that challenge. Uh, I was able to participate in this first ever collection of tephra airfall over the course of a months long eruption. So that's me right there um, with one of our ash buckets. So our team set up these buckets to collect ash falling from the sky around the actively erupting Cumbre Vieja volcano of the Canary Islands. And so from September through December of 2021, we bagged samples and brought them back to New York for chemical analysis. And the results of those chemical analyses are seen in the graph that I have on this slide. Um, what you're looking at is the daily average chemistry or chemical signature of each day of the eruption of that ash that we collected. And over time on the x-axis, you'll see that this is not a straight line. In fact, it, it moves up and down. This is incredible, right? We're seeing chemistry changing, recording its changes over the course of an eruption. And we're recording this in silica content or SiO2. We, I'm using this because higher silica contents tend to be associated with more explosive eruptions. So tracking chemistry is critical for hazard mitigation efforts. Another important finding out of our research uh, is that these chemical changes are associated with physical changes observable at the surface, volcanic tremor to be precise. We're seeing physical monitoring signal links to the chemical changes that occur and these directly impact uh, hazard forecasting models for when eruptions may end. And so, uh, although we do not have a nearby volcano, I hope that at the very least, the next time that you come across a storyteller in the park or in a museum, you'll have a newfound appreciation for it. Thank you. or 50 years in prison. Imagine you were 50 or 60 years old and you were just released today. You have only seen a cell phone on TV. You cannot use money to get on a city bus. And now everyone brings their own bag to the grocery store. What would you do? Who would you ask for help? This moment of release has been described as anxiety provoking and many face fear on their own. While some older people do have support leaving prison, many have no one, only their parole officer. This officer is responsible for your success, but they will lock you up if you fail to comply. I want to talk about the experiences of older people leaving prison to understand the challenges of reentry and navigating life on parole. I came to this topic on several fronts. First, I have an aging father who spent many years in and out of prison. Second, my mother is a retired parole officer. And third, I spent the last summer of my doctoral studies as an intern interviewing repeat offenders in Northern State Prison. One of the first people I interviewed was a man over 50 with a wife, a bachelor's degree, and a criminal history of reoffending. I wondered, how did he get here? Even with all the family support and education, which are usually stabilizing forces in someone else's life, that sent me on a quest to understand the experiences of older people leaving prison and how older offenders felt about working with parole officers. Ultimately, I interviewed 29 people and surveyed 57 people on parole and I also surveyed 39 officers. This was no small task, especially after parole shut down during the 2020 pandemic. I had to find other ways to find people to speak to who just left. My findings are that older people leaving prison have greater challenges than younger people, including more health problems, greater difficulties finding housing, and employment compared to their younger counterparts. There's an opportunity to provide immediate access to healthcare and improve housing options for older people leaving prison. Older people also have less social and family connections due to their age, their crimes, their time behind bars. But despite these challenges, 
Many were optimistic about their lives and future. They would benefit from the opportunity to expand their social connections. Parole officers largely understood the challenges and realized they needed to provide greater support for them to succeed. This is important because while older people are the least likely to reoffend, they rely more heavily on their officers for support. Officers would benefit from training on age specific illnesses and administrators should enact policies to support officers with elder populations on their caseload. As my description makes clear, officers have a unique role to play in supporting older people leaving prison. They can ensure services are centralized to be responsive to their needs, help them acclimate to the community and provide assistance with technology, which we need right now. <laughs> Providing support will make communities safer and help older people thrive in our communities after prison. Thank you. Health is a fundamental human right. But our country, America, has a problem with race and health outcomes. As the COVID-19 pandemic recently reminded us, people of color were disproportionately burdened with infections, hospitalizations, and death. These alarming health statistics are not unique to COVID. Here's the thing, if we truly want to eliminate health disparities by race, there's a few things that we need to do. Without question, we need to address the social determinants of health, systemic racism in healthcare, and the high cost of healthcare. But we also need to turn our attention to addressing the lack of racial diversity among health professionals, especially public health professionals. Public health professionals are responsible for the health of the nation. They do this with prevention and health promotion. And graduates of schools of public health who hold advanced degrees, they go on to work as researchers, policymakers, professors. They lead health departments at every level of government. The goals of eliminating health disparities and achieving health equity, it's central to their role. But our country is failing on that mission. Just look at any health statistic by race and you'll see what I mean, including those about black women dying from birth at a higher rate than anyone else. Obviously, diversity is not a cure-all for everything, but it is an important factor in this equation. In fact, research tells us that diverse teams are better equipped at solving problems than teams that are not diverse. Yet graduates from schools of public health remain overwhelmingly white and Asian. A 2020 study examining, uh, excuse me, a 2020 study looking at graduation rates saw that only 14.5% of graduates were black and Latino. My research seeks to change that. For part one of my research, I surveyed all 60 schools of public health in the United States. And I asked them about their recruitment and admission practices to increase diversity on their campuses. And for part two of my research, I looked at recruitment and graduation data from 2010 to 2020 at all schools of public health. For my quantitative data results, I saw that there was only a 5% change in the level of master's degrees being awarded to black and Latino students, but there was no significant change in the number of doctoral degrees being awarded to black and Latino students at schools of public health. And for the survey that I sent to each school of public health during the height of the pandemic shutdowns, it was evident that schools were still struggling with how to increase diversity on their campuses. But we need to solve this problem and we need to solve it now. The nation is becoming more diverse and there are no signs of this slowing down. A more diverse workforce has many benefits, including greater levels of trust, from people experiencing the highest burden of health disparities, 
our nation will be better able to understand and address the complex social, cultural, and economic factors that put some people at greater risk than others. And finally, communities of color will be more inclined to adopt some of these changes. But the missing link is we need more people of color, blacks and Latinos among public health professionals. After all, we are the ones who are being disproportionately burdened by health disparities. So our voices, our experiences, our expertise, it matters, it counts. We need to be at the table. We need to be represented among the next generation of public health professionals in the United States. Thank you. Good evening. The 50-year-long decline in the power of American unions is a major factor in the steady deterioration of the living standards of the American working class. Despite some recent encouraging signs, the union's ability to improve wages, benefits, and working conditions is still generally limited. The percentage of workers in unions has stagnated, and they have little impact on national economic and political debates. To use academic terminology, this is a bad thing. <laughs> Theories of how to revive the labor movement have mostly focused on more resources and better tactics, but my dissertation is a rare examination of an actual attempt to rejuvenate a union. It shows that unless unions nurture participatory democracy in their ranks, they are doomed to continue decades of futility. I was a participant observer in a decades-long effort by socialists and other activists to revitalize TWU Local 100, the strategically significant union which represents New York City's transit workers. My study chronicles their successes and shortcomings. Uh, it's based on over 80 interviews that I did with my coworkers, with union staff, with transit managers. All of this is now housed at NYU's Tamman Labor Library, along with some two dozen boxes of new materials I collected along the way, uh, spanning 30 years of union history. Insurgents finally took control of this moribund and autocratic union in 2001. Uh, there, our ambitions were grand to wholly transform the union, to uh, make it both a stronger union army and more democratic with rank and file workers participating in collective decision making and planning. At first, there was great success. The union was more tactically proficient, uh, and as a result, uh, mobilization soared. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the union's traditional hierarchical and top down culture prevailed. Uh, it proved easier to issue orders than to give workers a part in uh, deciding on the nature and form of their own struggles. As a result, worker initiative ebbed, um, the union building project was stymied, and the new leaders' ambitions were mostly thwarted. Now, I look back at these events in order to look forward to the, uh, to the crucial dilemmas faced by today's union activists. Uh, how to gain power while maintaining ideals, uh, how to uh, merge militant workplace spontaneity with planning and organization, and most important, how to build uh, the union army and union democracy side by side, not sacrificing one for the other. The Graduate Center's own Stanley Aronowitz once argued that union structure must prefigure the type of society they hope to establish. Participatory democracy is necessary to strengthen the labor movement, to lift up the entire working class, to limit inequality, and also to create the kind of active and engaged and aware citizens and human beings we so desperately need. 
Thank you. In the traditional classical Western concerto, the functions of the orchestra and the solo instrument are clearly distinguished. A solo instrument is set off against an orchestra, and the orchestra accompanies the solo instrument. My dissertation explores how Korean composer Eun Suk Chin has reinvented the concerto by blurring the line between solo instrument and orchestra. Recently, Qin has incorporated the sheng, an ancient Chinese instrument, into her work. The sheng is closely rela related in structure to the pipe organ, but is played with mouth. It can play multiple pitches simultaneously and features a sound that resembles the high-pitched reed instrument and even modern electronic sound. Due to its many capabilities, the sheng is attractive to modern composers. In my dissertation, I consider how Qin's concerto Su reimagines the orchestra as imitating and magnifying the sheng to create the impression of one large-scale instrument and new sound, what I call hyper sheng. In her revolutionary blending of sheng and orchestra, Qin creatively connects the European and Asian musical aesthetic and reshape how we think about orchestral music. In the music from Su, I will play for you in a moment, Qin recreates the sound of wild storm in the Korean mountains by blending the sheng and the orchestra to create the hyper sheng. To depict this windy storm, Qin requires the performers to play their instrument in unusual ways and produce unexpected sounds. The sheng player begins the music and produces a wind-like sound by blowing air through the sheng, using a percussive rhythm without making pitches. Similarly, the brass players reflect and amplify the sheng sound. Meanwhile, Percussion is to produce metallic sound to scratch piano strings that imitate the lightning, beat large drums to mimic thunder, and rub silk paper to evoke Sheng's airy sound. As a result, the solo Sheng and orchestra collaboratively produce large scale version of the Sheng's sonic structure. at the vanguard of today's leading composers, and I believe her creative innovation in transcending cultural boundaries reveals an exciting current in modern orchestral music. Thank you. In 2012, I moved into a rent-stabilized apartment in Washington Heights where my share of the rent was about $700. Over time, I began to see the neighborhood change, the neighborhood gentrify. Now, gentrification can mean a lot of different things, so let me quickly explain how I think about it in my own research. In 2000, I identify neighborhoods that are at risk of gentrification if they are low income and have few college-educated residents. By 2013, I, I, I count those neighborhoods as having gentrified if they experience above average increases in either of those two characteristics. Now, as neighborhoods change, you can imagine it's hard for longtime residents to stay in their homes. 
my own neighbor, uh, my own rent, my $700 apartment, would rent for well over $1,200 in Washington Heights today. Now, gentrification is not the only reason the city is so unaffordable, but it's, a, it's an important reason. And that's why I wanted to understand better how neighborhood gentrification spreads. So in my dissertation, I set out to measure the effect of gentrification on future neighborhood rents. And I was particularly interested in neighborhood affordability because when people search for housing, they search for neighborhoods they think are affordable. And from those neighborhoods, they choose the housing options that best fit their needs. Now, I'm not the first person to ask some of these questions about gentrification, but I am one of the first to use spatial regression techniques to be able to quantify the effect of gentrification in one neighborhood on another. Using two decades of data um, in LA, Chicago, and New York, I found evidence of gentrification's ripple effects. Now, I found similar uh, results, similar findings in all the cities I studied, but let's focus on Manhattan, since that's where we are tonight. If you take a look at the map behind me, you can see the neighborhoods in light gray are neighborhoods that gentrified between 2000 and 2013. You can also see that these neighborhoods cluster in different po pockets across the city. Lower East Side, Washington Heights, where I used to live, and Harlem. Now, I did not find a, a, a statistically different, uh, difference between neighborhoods that gentrified and those that did not. But I did find differences in future neighborhood rents between neighborhoods that did gentrify. Particularly, neighborhoods that gentrified in clusters of other, of other gentrified neighborhoods, so those highlighted by blue, by, in blue, for example, were, had higher future neighborhood rents than those that gentrified in isolation, like those in the red. And this makes sense. Landlords raise rents not only as their neighborhood is gentrifying, but in, in anticipation of gentrification, as they can see it coming from a couple of neighborhoods away. And that's what I want residents in gentrifying neighborhoods to understand. Your future neighborhood rents are actually more associated with, what, with the gentrification that's happening around you than the gentrification in your own neighborhood. City officials, I hope, can use these, uh, my findings and this, this, this understanding of neighborhood dynamics to, to identify neighborhoods that are more likely to gentrify and develop neighborhood-specific anti-displacement policies. I also think my own experience as a rent-stabilized tenant in a gentrifying neighborhood is a good example of the type of tenant-focused policies we need to keep households, to keep residents in their homes. Thank you. Imagine someone diagnosed with cancer who is undergoing treatment, which already takes a toll on the body. But in that process, they become critically ill, end up on life support in an intensive care unit. And while there, they experience severe muscle wasting and muscle weakness. So severe at times they're unable to use their arms and legs. That is what I see every day in my role as a nurse practitioner in a hospital for cancer. We all know that the better physical shape one is in before falling ill, the better able they are to weather the stressors of illness. It got me thinking and made me take a closer look. Then I find out that 80% of Americans fail to meet the recommended physical activity level and that about half of us are unaware of the link between cancer and physical activity. It is undeniable that the technological advances that have made our lives easier have also made us more sedentary. Cancer can be disabling and can alter the self-identity of those who experience it. My research takes a look statistically at data from a national survey given to adults in America to, us, um, to, um, given to, adults in America to assess their awareness of cancer prevention messages to see how measures of personal agency, social support, and demographic factors influence physical activity behavior. Secondly, for the subgroup of this sample who've ever had cancer, do these factors affect them the same way? Physical activity behavior here comprises of sitting time and amount of moderate to vigorous physical activity in a week. Final analysis included valid survey data from 1,600 respondents 
Analysis were conducted in two blocks. The first block included everyone, and in the second, in the second block, the sample was split between those who've had cancer and those who never had cancer to assess for differences in relationships. My study found that most of the factors that made a difference in the physical activity behavior of the general sample, such as using wearable activity trackers, feeling strong and comfort with financial income, did not matter for cancer survivors. Additionally, female cancer survivors with larger households participated more in physical activity. Though not without limitations, my study compels us, all of us, to, um, to engage, um, to use, sorry, to utilize activity trackers that are already built into our personal devices, such as our phones or watches, and to decrease prolonged sitting. But I just told you this did not work for the cancer survivors, which tells us that for this special population, targeted and tailored approach is needed. Thank you. Hello? You remember cassettes, right? <laughs> Old plastic rectangles with magnetic tape inside. Sounds kind of okay. You need a pencil to rewind them. I wrote my dissertation about them. I got a PhD in music, writing a dissertation that is not quite about music, at least not directly, but about all those non-musical things, like tapes, but also their liner notes, pictures, and stickers that provide an extra layer of meaning and value to musical production. I argue that these physical things that we once took for granted help us connect to music and through music different than the ways that today's streaming services allow. To support this claim, I did ethnographic research in Argentina with independent labels that currently produce cassette tapes in Argentina. <laughs> um, not the kinds that you can buy today at Urban Outfitters, but those DIY, artisanal, producing small numbers, tapes like the one that you can see behind me, that usually circulate via interpersonal exchanges like the merch table that I show. I, working closely with tape makers from genres that range from indie pop to ambient music to punk and thrash metal, I have been, I, I focused on discovering what motivates these people to spend hours of their day pushing buttons on tape recorders, cutting stickers, designing album art, to materialize music that already exists on the internet. Nobody makes money from them, and the people who buy them usually don't even have the right equipment to listen to them. <laughs> so my dissertation asks, in a time in which we don't need physical media for music, for songs to circulate, why are cassettes, cassettes still being made and why do they matter? Through ethnographic methods, interviews, participant observation, field notes, I found that cassettes matter to these communities because of the connections that they facilitate. Cassettes connect people in human ways, for example, when this tape was made, the three members of this label got together to drink beer and eat some empanadas and while restocking the tapes for an upcoming event. The making of a cassette inevitably connects labels to other people. For example, uh, to the artists that they admire, of course, but um, also to many others. Holding this cassette from Van Los Waffles, Nacho from label Poco Proporcional once told me, this tape is the tangible evidence that, the, that they, this band, Los Waffles, exist, and that the photographer, the designer, me, the public, we all exist. Tapes also connect these people to a larger history of independent music production in Argentina. And through their materialities, they generate a myriad of other connections, such as the album art that they circulate, or through the stickers that are left on their J cards. Focusing on these connections that are fostered through the materialities of tapes, I theorize the notion of relational value 
a value that emerges from the relational, value, the relational qualities of things that I believe to be an important contribution to my field. In a time in which consuming music can feel alienating and algorithm driven, people are finding ways to make music matter in different ways. My dissertation helps us understand the role that the non-musical plays in the value and meaning of musical production. Thank you. I was 74 when I enrolled in CUNY's Urban Education Doctoral Program. And one thing I knew for sure was that I was just too old to do a dissertation that didn't make a difference in the real world. Over the decades of my professional career as a social worker, I developed a keen interest in out-of-school time education. I saw with my own eyes what research confirms, that high-quality after-school and summer enrichment programs can be important contributors to children's learning and healthy development. I decided to tackle what I saw as the most glaring er um, the most glaring problem in the out-of-school time field, and that is the weaknesses in existing federal policy. I conducted an analysis of the largest federal program in this area, the 21st Century Community Learning Centers. My aim was to develop a set of research-based recommendations that could be offered to those in charge of monitoring and revising existing policy specifically the U.S. Department of Education and the United States Congress. I began by examining all the publicly available data on the program. I then developed a set of hypotheses about the strengths and weaknesses of the existing program, then used my findings to interview 15 experts in the after-school field including a former U.S. Secretary of Education and several local program leaders. What I discovered is that the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program, which is supposed to focus on academic and social enrichment, these programs have unfortunately become more school, with a decided emphasis on homework help and tutoring. And so young people's participation levels are too low to make a difference. My dissertation proposes 10 recommendations for addressing these and other problems, beginning with a clear definition of enrichment. Four decades of research indicate that enrichment responds to student interests, uses active learning methods, and expands young people's horizons. In short, enrichment looks more like robotics and chess clubs, and as you can see here, culinary arts than tutoring or homework help. Last month, I was invited to present my findings to eight members of the senior staff uh, working on policy at the U.S. Department of Education. And just today, the government issued its draft non-regulatory guidance on the program and asked for public comment. I think you know that they will be hearing from me. Oh my goodness. Uh, how about another round of applause for our fantastic presenters? Um, wow. Uh, so proud of the amazing research that you've done 
and I'm looking forward to putting lots of hoods on you in the week ahead. Um, but like all great communicators, didn't they leave you wanting to learn more? Mm -hmm. And uh, like all of you, I can't wait to see what they do next. Okay. Well, now we're going to have the voting for the different awards. The, the judges are all busy doing their thing, um, so they're going to vote, but audience now is the time for you. And so there's a QR code. I have no idea whether it's going to work for your phone to scan up there. It does, okay. But it's also in your program, so you can use either one. Now you get one vote. I know you want to have 13, but you get one. Okay. You don't get a second choice. You just have to say, who did the best job of communicating their research to the public. And if you're joining us online, you can look in the chat. There's a link that will take you to the voting platform. So audience, you have two minutes. So you can think, you know, go through the talks in your head. Two minutes. Uh, while you're doing that, we're setting up on stage for the Q&A session. Uh, and uh, I'll circle back in a moment. We're, uh, we're set up on stage. I'll invite our students to come on up. Still a few more seconds to do your voting. And audience, I hope you've been thinking about questions because we do have mics uh, here in the aisles. Um, I have a few backup questions, but I'll bet you have plenty and we may not need mine. So, um, have they ready? Uh, if possible, you may have uh, general questions that you could pose and we'll have uh, one or several students answer. Or you may have specific questions that you want to direct to a particular speaker. Uh, that's up to you. Okay, last chance. Whether if you're online, the countdown clock says six, five, four, three, two. Okay, the voting is closed. Okay, uh, so Marina, <laughs> gosh, <laughs> fancy here. <laughs> All right, so um, I welcome folks to come on up. I'm, we want you to get out of your chairs if possible because we have the microphones here. Um, Screens is going. We'll wait for that noise to disappear. Um, so thank you all. You're all fantastic. And I'll ask you to kind of share the mics amongst yourself. Yes, yes. All right. Um, so maybe I'll lead off, uh, and, and uh, the last will be first. So I have a question for Jane. And my question for you is, if you were writing federal policy, if you were the boss, you were in charge, what would be your top priority? What would you do? And I'll ask you to share the mic there. If I were writing federal policy, I would be very clear in defining what is meant by the legislative intent. In the legislation, the authorizing legislation says the purpose of the program is enrichment but enrichment is never defined. And enrichment is defined out there in the real world because there is 40 years of research, particularly that conducted by a University of Connecticut professor named Joseph Renzulli. Really great stuff. It's clear what he's talking about. He defines it. He's got four characteristics to it. So why the government does not give more guidance to the states and to the grantees is a real puzzle to me, and I'm still trying to f understand that. Okay, well, I think there's still time to elect you to public office. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, let me go maybe to uh, Melanie, so go back to the beginning. Uh, so, how could we address the real or perceived coercion? How can it be minimized? Yeah, I think it's a really tricky problem because we, we don't even at this point know what exactly is coercion and what exactly is voluntariness. Um, and some argue that the entire process is coercive. And so if you say that you can't have any coercion, then we'd have to do with the, away with the entire process to begin with. Um, I think the best thing that we could do at this point, at least to like take a step in the right direction, is to ensure that defendants are given a voice in their decision-making process. Um, a lot of times you see that defendants have one or two minutes to talk to their defense attorney and they met them that same day that they entered this like life-altering decision. Um, and so I think that that's at least the first step 
in ensuring that people are making voluntary decisions is that they actually have an opportunity to talk to the people who are helping them make it. What a concept. So, but isn't an inadequate defense uh, an appealable thing? Yes, but that wouldn't necessarily be considered an inadequate defense. And a lot of times, unfortunately, you're waiving your right to appeal when you accept a plea offer. And so a lot of Ooh. times you don't even necessarily know that you won't have that opportunity by making the decision that you're about to make. So kind of a double whammy there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stanley, wondering if you uh, identified any differences in the level of bias uh, based on age or gender. Are women more biased than men? Are older people more biased to accented speech than younger people? Um, in the groups that you just mentioned, no. But there is a small difference between the heavy and the light accent. And so I think I mentioned it in my talk that the heavier accent you have, people will judge you more for that. And it's less forgiving. But if it's a bit lighter, then they think otherwise. And if it's close to a native speaker, that is considered the standard and ideal. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, yes, I had a question for uh, Adeshima Oyo. Um, yes. In your research, I was wondering if, uh, when you were speaking to the schools, if you gathered any data about how much influence in admissions or in terms of people seeking admission to these schools did the job possibilities and the salaries for those for those jobs have in other words do positions in public health across the spectrum pay enough to attract a diverse student body sure so i don't think it was a matter of payment for attracting um, students of color I think it was more so an issue of students of color feeling like they have a, a voice at the table and the role of schools of public health to actually make this the focus. There's, there was very little accountability at the schools of public health to make this something that they needed to address. But when you went to a school's website, when you looked at their mission statements, you saw things about diversity, equity, and inclusion. There was a lot of lip service, but very little action. And not because schools didn't necessarily want to do the work, but sometimes they just didn't know where to start. So I think the fact that I did this research was a, a huge step in the right direction because we have this data already for direct healthcare providers like doctors and dentists and, and nurses, but we don't have the data for those who work in public health who are making decisions that impact millions of people. So public health professionals, they work at the population level. They don't work at that individual level. So it was less about the, the monetary benefits of attracting students of color is really about the schools really highlighting that focus and also understanding what are some of the barriers for why sometimes students of color don't apply. Oftentimes they have higher levels of debt because they don't have the financial resources to have generational wealth where they didn't have to pay for school. There's a, a lot of different factors that go into why students of color are not more represented at schools of public health in the United States. Great, thank you very much. A question from this side. Thank you. Another question for Melanie Fessinger. Um, in the little bit of reading I've done about pleas, all the authors talk about a quote-unquote trial tax that violates people's Sixth Amendment right to for jury by trial, or trial by jury, excuse me. Um, all the authors also speak about the necessity of eliminating mandatory minimums um, so that discretion in sentencing is taken away from district attorneys and returned to judges. If that were to happen, which I imagine is a politically monumental task, would, you know, if, if that worked, do you think people would continue to take pleas since you're interested in whether this is voluntary or not? Yeah, it's a great question. It's actually what I was trying to tackle in my dissertation that I didn't talk much about here was that what I was trying to do was look at how the size of the differential between what you were being offered and what you would get at trial was affecting your decisions. Um, and so I was actually offering people different sizes of pleas and being like, in, in the example that I talked about, right, Alfred was death or your life, right, death or 30 years. But a lot of times we see the difference as something like 20 years versus two years or 20 years versus 10 years. And so those kinds of differences like you're talking about, which would change if we were able to do things with mandatory minimums. Um, I think that what we're seeing and what I'm trying to do with my work is trying to understand how those sentencing differentials 
kind of have a twofold effect in that they're likely to affect the plea decision itself. So you get, be you get offered a better deal, you're more likely to take it. But if you get offered a better deal, does that mean necessarily that you think that it was voluntary, right? Or do you think that you got such a good deal that maybe it was just like, well, I don't really have a choice. You're not really giving me a fair deal. I can't actually take that risk. Um, and so I think that if we do things like shifting mandatory minimums and stuff like that, which of course is a monumental task, um, what we might see is really changes in both plea decisions themselves and also in those perceptions of voluntary decisions. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Augustina. Um, I wanted to know what do you think about the role of other non-streaming forms of music like uh, um, records or uh, CDs and how that might be different from cassettes and uh, why did you choose cassettes as opposed to those other forms? Thank you so much for your question. Uh, we were actually just talking about that a minute ago. So um, the reason why I chose cassettes for this um, research project is because in the Argentina, in the context of Argentina today, uh, vinyl records are too prohibited for independent record labels. So it's not a matter of like they can, they're not choosing vinyl as much as like they can't, right? So it's um, when I did an internship here in an independent record label in Brooklyn, uh, it was much different. And it seemed like cassettes were just like adding to the format availability of records, just like some people like vinyl, some people like cassettes, so why don't we just put a lot of options out there? But in the case of Argentina, where there's only one a vinyl pressing factory that gets co-opted by the m bigger corporations that produce music in Argentina and it therefore become unaffordable for the independent labels, then cassettes is the only thing that they have. So it's interesting to see um, how they are doing, what they're doing because of the, um, their context and you know, the economic uh, idiosyncrasies of the country. Okay, we have another question from the side. Hi, I have a question for Nithia. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, yeah, oh, oh, can you hear me now? Okay, cool. Um, so my question is, how would you break the school to prison pipeline when early intervention is considered a privilege that you know some youth may not have? So it's like, if you have a kid who's undocumented, someone on Medicaid, someone, you know, of minority background who has to deal with medical racism, like, how would you break the pipeline if they don't benefit from a certain privilege or have access, sorry? That's a wonderful question, thank you for asking. I think that one of the best ways that we can break the school to prison pipeline for children with disabilities, or any child rather, um, is simply by being able to educate teachers um, on the best means of identifying children who may be at risk and uh, ensuring that schools have those resources. And as you mentioned, there are children who are in our schools today who may not necessarily um, ha have those, you know, have the full resources at home or, you know, within their families to access the best educational resources outside of school, such as tutoring or, for example, healthcare. In the case of disability, the types of accommodations that they may need. And so it's really, um, I think, really something that needs to be addressed at that early point of, of, of life, um, where t if teachers can identify it, if teachers are given the resources to identify those children who are at risk, and then schools are, while resourced enough to be able to offer that assistance to these students, then we are benefiting basically the entire group of uh, students and preparing them for success later on in life. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question on this side. Hello. Uh, I have a question for Samantha. Uh, I'm a chemistry major myself, so I um, have a question about the data interpretation. So in, in your research, it's shown um, the data is uh, fluctuating between 
45 to 48 percent, and how is that fluctuation can be interpreted to the uh, prediction or anticipation of eruption, and also um, is that fluctu fluctuation accurate enough um, in a as a method uh, within the correct uh, collecting of the sample? That is, um, um, why is that a good method? Thank you for your question. Uh, it, so to answer the, I guess, the first part, uh, those fluctuations that we see are uh, a couple of weight percent in silica content. And that is significant, but it does not impact the overall explosive behavior as observed for this eruption. Uh, sort of the main exciting part is that those changes are linked to volcanic tremor. And so in the future, if we see tremor signals that indicate even higher silica than what we've measured here, it could indicate a more catastrophic shift in eruption style, right? Uh, this method is fairly robust. The error bars are smaller than the sizes of the symbols. Uh, and the analytical sort of zapping that we did were of the glass in between crystals in ash samples. And so this is rapidly quenched. There's no um, diffusion of elements or, or migration of elements in, after quenching or turning from molten rock to solid really rapidly. Um, so it is our best way to estimate the magma chemistry um, while it was still liquid. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question for Mark. So thinking about the uh, the more recent fall of the, uh, the power of the Transportation Workers Union. Uh, do you see any parallels between that union and, say, UAW? Well, UAW is interesting now because they just changed their leadership, um, and and our the leadership is making many of the right noises about uh, increasing worker participation. Um, it's a it's a it's an interesting dilemma because uh, we need leaders to look toward uh, that kind of shift in the way unions work, but also many members themselves are, are resigned. They've, they've lived their whole lives in a, in a situation in which uh, they expect the union to be what's called a service union, in which I pay my dues and I expect that, that the union rep will come in and, uh, and fix my problem when I have a problem. So. We need to change the culture of the leadership, uh, and the leadership and leaderships tend to favor army over democracy. But we also need to change the uh, cultural expectations of workers themselves, so that they can, so that we can go back to where unions were in the in the 30s and 40s, when workers expected that they were going to organize and fight on the shop floor by themselves, and that was part of of how they thought that they should act. Great, thank you, Mark. So a question for Stella. Uh, so what approaches would you advocate for increasing activity amongst cancer survivors? I'll give you, thank you for your question. Um, so um, like I said, um, you know, t tailored and, and targeted approaches needed. So um, I'll give you an example a real life example. Um, I had a patient um, who, when I went in to do my exam, I did what we call passive range of motions. So helping the patient. And then I said, you know, while you're lying here, your muscles are getting weaker and your bones get stiff. So when you're just lying here, when you get a ch when, uh, every chance you get, just move your arms and your, and your legs. And um, just like that, every time I did my exam, and eventually, when she got discharged, she, did hi she hired um, private duty nurses who um, continued to do that activity with her, but they did beyond that. They, and eventually, with that, she was, able to, um, she was able to walk. But this was someone who was, you know, like I said, you know, actually the picture that I showed you, she, had, she was worse than that, she had COVID. She was in a hospital for a long time. And you know, I mean, 
this, this was two years ago, and she just passed away, but just um, la a couple of weeks ago. But believe it or not, when I walked into the room, the husband said, I remember you. You're the one who, who taught us how to do this. And so that for her, stuff like that, because um, what, what one, one of the distinguishing um, factors for um, patients with cancer or cancer survivors is one, you know, um, they're, they're very ill and they're physiolog you know, they have physiologic debilitations, right, that already makes them more vulnerable than everybody else. And so simply saying, you know, use this, you even though they might want to, they're just already much weaker. So they, you need to look at them individually Great. too. Thank you. Uh, so Casey, uh, you talked about your sort of context as being relevant to gentrification. Um, so do you see that gentrification is a, a linear process, like it just keeps going one way? Is it kind of fluctuate? Is it reversible? Um, so that's actually one of the things I'm trying to argue in the paper that's coming out of this, is that because gentrification clusters in space, as you saw on the maps, and I can make maps of LA and Chicago and Houston and Dallas, which I also studied, um, you can see neighborhood gentrification cluster in space. So if you, part of my argument is we need to use methods that I'll correct for and address that, that, uh, that particular part of the phenomenon that it clusters in space, which, which is also what I find that there's like a ripple effect. Um, in terms of like time and um, linearity of it, uh, I think it's complicated. And it, I'm from Detroit, that's why I ask. Uh, yeah, yes. Detroit's, you know, kind of. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, I mean, that's, that's, there's a whole literature on that, which isn't exactly part of my dissertation, but it's something I, I, I've been thinking about in terms of other papers to write, um, and I've published on separately. Um, but it really is, and this is one of the reasons why I separate out each city and run analyses city by city, because each city is different. Each, the context in which gentrification, the time point, I, I think my ro results are pretty robust in New York, but I could imagine if I had changed the window in which I identified neighborhoods that gentrified, um, the neighborhoods would be, have been a little bit different like, based on that. So it, there's, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but improved methods that center planners could use yeah. and so on. Yeah. So, great, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask two more just to make sure everybody gets a shot. So, um, uh, Hyun Kyung, I'd like to ask you about this amazing sound we heard and um, you know, as, as we see globalization of music and uh, sounds and instruments crossing borders and being integrated in new ways, uh, are you seeing that there's increased use of this remarkable instrument in amongst, uh, say, Western composers? Mm. Not yet, because it's kind of a weird thing. Yeah, actually, I don't see the Western composer using the, the other instrument, but they employ the, um, like, uh, Balinese music, but they use the, what, the percussion instrument for the Balinese. Like, uh, what, um, Unsuk Chin's the other concerto, she employs the, what, the Balinese the, what, traditional percussion instrument and to produce the uh, similar sound to the Balinese music, she made the, uh, the prepared piano and uh, actually the sound is really like percussive. It couldn't feel like uh, a real piano sound. Like that uh, many Western composers and the Asian composers, no matter what composers, they employ the uh, cultural the, uh, the combination and they try to produce the new sound. Thank you very much. So I saved the toughest question for last, and that one's for Asher, so uh, sorry about that. Uh, so your tough question is, as you think about January 6th and the events that have transpired since then, uh, based on your research, do you think we're headed for redemption or catastrophe? <laughs> uh, no pressure. <laughs> Okay, let's try this one, all right. Um, the tentative conclusion that I arrive at really is that um, liberal institutions and at least discourses are pretty durable, um, particularly in moments of crisis, uh, in part because uh, they get a lot of practice, right? They uh, really emerge in these kinds of moments. Um, at the same time, I mean, uh, apocalyptic discourses are always contested. Um, it's not, uh, 
each, uh, sorry, <laughs> each uprising or, um, I, I hesitate to call uh, January 6th a, a revolution, um, but each uh, moment of contentious politics, shall we say, um, might be experienced differently depending on uh, the parties involved. If we take the, um, the modern revolutions like uh, the Dutch, the English, the American, the French, um, if we take those as examples, invariably we find uh, sorts of these, these apocalyptic discourses circulating often explicitly. Um, the earlier you are in time, uh, the more heavily they rely on scripture directly. Um, and so they're very expressly apocalyptic. Uh, but depending on which side of the conflict people find themselves on, um, that, that really determines whether they present it as a catastrophic apocalypse or a redemptive apocalypse, right? Um, whether the attitude is one of, oh, this is terrible, they're destroying the world, or, oh, this is great, we're remaking the world, right? Um, it, it really is a, a, a highly context-dependent and, and subjective evaluation. It's like the wave-particle duality. Both can coexist, and that's where we are. All right. Well, thank you for these a wonderful discussion. <laughs> and I know some of you saw me get these envelopes. Um, so before we announce that there's a little bit more to do, I want to acknowledge the donors and supporters who've made the showcase possible, which with special thanks to longstanding foundation board member, Joanna Migdahl. So thank you, Joanna. <laughs> and for putting this wonderful showcase together from choosing the presenters to helping them hone their presentations. You could tell they worked a little bit for this, right? Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank the Office of Public Programs, uh, headed by Karen Sander. Uh, Thanks also to Professor Duncan Faherty, the faculty lead for the dissertation showcase, and to Professor Steve Jarrett, who helped coach our science students. Yeah. Right. And to the many people in the provost's office and the communications office who've worked hard to make this a successful event. And so now we're going to learn, let's see, whom the audience selected for their award winner. Okay. You had a tough choice. I mean, this is, yeah. Okay, so all the presenters, a little drum roll happening here, uh, have achieved the extraordinary, earning their doctoral degrees through years of steadfast commitment to their wide-ranging scholarship. And what we've asked the audience to do is to just give their impression, not, not judging your life, your graduate career, <laughs> just the impression about your brief presentation of the work tonight. Uh, and. And it was really hard, you all did great. So you've made, uh, with the decisions, I'm honored to announce the recipient of the Audience Choice Award is Melanie Fessinger. friendly here, we don't do the balloons and confetti thing. Okay. Um, the judges have also made their decision, and I'm honored to announce that the winner of the 2022 Presidential Prize for Public Communication is Stanley Chen. Congratulations to all of our extraordinary presenters and to the community of family and friends and doctoral peers in our audience, faculty mentors. Um, you've all been part of this great journey. So, uh, you know, it's really important. The wonderful research, the ability to communicate it to the public, they're fundamental to doctoral education here at the Graduate Center and vital preparation for careers wherever you end up. Uh, we know you'll make a difference in the world and uh, you're, you're just well on the way. So thank you all for being here tonight, for enjoying the evening. Please join us in the lobby and in the James Gallery. We're having a reception, and you can follow up and ask some more questions to congratulate our amazing presenters. So thank you all.